So I know Randy um, through stories and legends before I met him. <laughs> uh, many of you know that I'm uh, adjunct faculty with Nate's Indigenous Learning Community and Randy was one of the founding members of that community and so his uh, hard work over many years has uh, been what we've built upon in the subsequent years. And so I was really excited to meet him and I feel like I've known him from afar because I've read a lot of his work, uh, of which you can find in a variety of uh, places, whether it's online publications for uh, big name magazines or newspapers or book chapters or his own books. And so uh, I feel like I've been able to get to know him even though I've just met him for the first time tonight. And uh, I'm grateful that I'm able to meet someone that uh, I, I stand on his shoulders in some sense, as many others do in the Nates community. And so uh, for that, uh, thank you, Randy. And it's really great to meet your wife as well. And at the end of uh, a section on his webpage, if you look up Randy Woodley, you, you get a lot of hits. And uh, on he's even got his own URL, randywoodley.com. And on there, he lists other websites where he can find him. And one of, uh, uh, one of the things that he mentions is that uh, Edith is a great partner to him. And I witnessed that when we were eating dinner. And she elbowed him to remind him to take his pills. <laughs> and <so laughs> The last thing I want to say before we hear him is uh, one of the f one of the first books I read by Randy is uh, this one, which is on sale, Shalom and the Community of Creation, and it's in the Prophetic Christianity series. And I think uh, Randy is a prophetic voice for the church. Uh, and in Indigenous conception, prophetic voice isn't just someone who hears from the Creator, but also takes the time to quiet their heart and minds to hear from the land and from the rest of the community of creation so that uh, others of us can hear and open our minds to that. And so I appreciate uh, both Randy and Edith's heart to do that uh, work on our behalf and their commitment to continue to train up others uh, to follow uh, good paths uh, as they walk in this, in this life. So can you welcome Randy up as he comes? I don't want to get too lively because I know you won't think it's theology unless it's boring. <laughs> so, but I do want to take an opportunity to say a few things before. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, you know, uh, one, one of the, the things, <laughs> uh, Madam President, that you said, uh, the, really the only thing I heard that made me feel at home was when you said the two words, disruptive ideas. And I thought, oh, oh, good, I can be myself tonight. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Zacharias, or you said your students can call you Danny, so I'm guessing that's okay too, right? Uh, and uh, the rest of the folks, uh, the uh, uh, Hayward family and, and others who've uh, invited me here, and especially to uh, Tammy and uh, the Mi'kmaq people, and the, to be in this uh, country, it's an honor. Um, we travel and have traveled for for four years, we just traveled around from reserve to reserve all across the United States and Canada and mentored a number of people and did a lot of speaking. Um, and uh, th those were long years. We homeschooled our kids as we did it. And, but we had the rich experience of being around all kinds of native people almost everywhere. And uh, that was probably the most rich experience of our lives. We've been in native work serving our own people for about 30 years. And, uh, and the, I consider those the, the richest times. And, and I'm gonna share a story with you because um, I know in, in Canada, uh, and, and it's a wonderful practice to, to recognize uh, the host people's land that you're on. Um, but wherever we went to speak, um, we always sought the blessing of the host people who were, um, whose land that we were going on. And that's what we were taught. And so I want to tell you a story about um, this particular place. We were actually going to uh, Ojibwe country. We were going to the Lacouture Reservation in Hayward, uh, Wisconsin. Funny, Hayward and Hayward, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So um, uh, 
And when I got there, I asked the, the group that had invited me. Um, some of you know maybe Youth with a Mission. Uh, you've heard of them, uh, the largest uh, quote-unquote youth organization uh, in the, the world, I think, in terms of ministry. And they invited us to come up for a week and teach in um, you know, Ojibwe country. So um, the first thing I did when we got there, and I said, you know, who welcomed you on the land? And, uh, and, and no one had. And so I said, well, we can't speak. And, and this has actually happened a couple of different times, and we've worked through it. Um, Creator has always sort of found a way. But we just are emphatic that we won't speak unless the host people welcome us somehow. <coughs> so, um, so it just so happened that day that uh, this young Ojibwe kid was hitchhiking from Seattle. And uh, he was uh, adopted when he was about two years old, raised in Seattle by a white family. And uh, he had had an LSD trip. And in that LSD trip, he saw Jesus. And Jesus told him, I want you to go back to your reservation, where you're from. And he knew he's from somewhere way out, you know, in Wisconsin. So, so it just so happens, by coincidence, that um, the director of the YWAM base saw him hitchhiking on the road and, and picked him up. And he said, you know, who are you and who are your people? And he said, I don't know. I come to find that out. Jesus told me on an LSD trip to come out here. <laughs> and he said, oh, okay. Well, uh, do you have any place to stay? No. Okay, you can stay with us. Uh, you hungry? Yeah. So, so, so they just taken this guy in. And, and so I get there and I'm asking this question about uh, um, if... Uh, they have been invited to the land, and are we welcome on the land? So we finally figured out, okay, we're not going to be able to do it. So I, so I took the opportunity to this, this young Ojibwe kid, and I said, hey, stick with me today. I want to teach you some things. He said, okay. So I said, and I told him, whenever uh, we go to someone else's land, even, now my, uh, my dad told me when I even on driving down the road to stop and put tobacco down when I go into someone else's land. Now, I got to tell you, I haven't done that um, just because we travel through so many places, but we have asked for permission. And, uh, and so, so it was really important that uh, we do this. And so we figured out who the elder was. Um, he was in charge of, he was one of the two leaders of the Medewin Lodge, um, their religion, and he also was a tribal elder, the advisor to the council. And so we figure we're pretty safe going to this guy. So we go and we get the, a traditional basket of, you know, a closed basket, elder basket, uh, you know, consistent flour and tobacco and, you know, um, some flashlights and coast hangers and, you know, um, sugar and coffee and all the kind of things that some fresh fruit that elders like, you know. And so, so we go to his house, knock on the door, and, and uh, his wife comes and, you know, I guess people visit him often for advice. And so she said, oh, come on in, set the basket down. And he's on the phone and he comes back and, and he says, uh, you know, who are you guys and what do you want? So I explained to him who we were and he says, well, what are you going to be teaching? And uh, I said, well, you know, and I explained who we are and how we, we do. Uh, at the time, I think was, we were calling it contextual native ministry. I don't think really call it that anymore, but that's sort of what we were calling it. Uh, now we just call it like being Indians. Um, but uh, so, uh, so he starts telling me, he says, you know, what you all believe and what we believe is not that different. And he kind of just told me a couple of subtle differences. And he's, he said, you know, when I was a younger person, I wanted to find out what you Christians believe. And he said, so I, I went to this, I enrolled for a semester in this, uh, this college. It's called Moody Bible College. You ever heard of that? And... Uh, so, uh, so, so he talked about that, but every now and then he kept interrupting the story, which meant he was trying to get a point across. And every now and then he said, you know, my uncle, he told me, never disrespect Jesus because Jesus is a great spirit. So he would go on and he'd tell us more and more, and he told us about how he just came back from a a big meeting around the U.S. and Canada of all the uh, Geechee Dawans, the big... Uh, spiritual leaders, and, and they were trying to decide, like, how do they get along better with the Christians, right? 
And uh, he had stories about all this. He, I think we sat there for maybe two hours. But I think at least six or seven times he said this thing about his uncle. And, and, and he told me at one point, he said, my uncle trained most of the leaders around this area here, he, most of the spiritual leaders. He lived to be 108 years old. And, uh, and, and my uncle would tell me all these stories about Jesus. So I asked my uncle one time. I said, uncle, you know, how do you know all this about Jesus? Did you go to residential school? He said, oh, no, no. He said, I never did that. And uh, he said, did, uh, did the priest teach you? And he goes, no, I've never been to church. And he said, yeah, but you tell me all this stuff about Jesus. What, have you been reading the Bible? And he said, no. He said, I told you, uh, you know, a number of times in the past, um, Jesus is a great spirit, and I talked to him. And he said, well, yeah, you talked to him, but how do you know all these things he's done? And he said, my uncle looked at me so quizzically, and he said, well, of course he talks back. And then he said, I'm going to pray for you now. Well, the message was this. Um, if you, uh, uh, it's just like when I used to pastor and I would tell the children's sermon. If you understood the implications of what I just said, you don't have to stay for the, the lecture. You can go on home. I used to tell our parishioners, if you got the children's sermon, just go on home because that's the, the core of it. But, but if you decide to stay, I'll try to make it interesting enough for you to, to stick around. So. so just a little bit about myself and my social location. <clears throat> Since I'll probably, uh, you can imagine, be talking about white privilege tonight and things, I'm going to go ahead and share my own privilege in places. I'm a male. I'm straight. I'm educated. Uh, light skin. A copious body size, so I take up a little bit of space in the room. Um, uh, th that's my own description, by the way. This is the softest way I could say it. Uh, Able-bodied, middle-class, Native American, legal descendant of the United Ketua Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma. Um, raised in working-class, poor family. I'm uh, the first, my, me and my, I don't know, I have maybe a thousand cousins. Uh, we're the first generation non-coal miners in uh, my mom's side. And uh, so we come from uh, working poor, union organizing people, um, educated later in life. Um, so I think I was, and this is where I really need my wife. My wife just did this, 55 when I finally got my PhD. So uh, older, um, and you can decide if that's positive or negative or what privileges or not privileged. Uh, each uh, month or so, I realize there's a little less privilege I'm feeling in my body, but um, raised in a very multicultural, multiracial atmosphere, uh, and I've experienced racial oppression uh, in some pretty severe ways in different times and places. So, um, I don't know if you recognize this fellow right here. Uh, he he kind of talked like this. History will be kind to me because I intend to write it. Winston Churchill. And he did. And it was. Because whoever rep interprets history interprets theology and, and gets to the, uh, mythologize society into their own worldview. And uh, so the winners write history, as we like to say. Um, and I teach my students in our, our history classes uh, there's no such thing as history. There's no such thing as church history. There's only histories and church histories. Um, so uh, even under the best circumstances, it's often a case of might that makes right. A couple quotes I want to read to you by um, uh, one of your writers, your indigenous writers. Uh, and I always uh, mess up his name, but uh, Taikiki, I think. Alfred, the machinery of indigenous, and he wrote education, but I'm positing religion because I think it applies, may simply replicate European systems. But even if such religion resembles traditional Native American systems on the surface without strong and healthy leaders committed to, to, to traditional values and the preservation of our nationhood, they are going to fail. Our children will judge them to have failed because an education or a religion that is not based on traditional principles of respect and harmonious coexistence will inevitably tend to reflect the cold, 
calculating and coercive ways of the modern state. The whole of the decolonization process will have been for nothing if indigenous religion or education has no meaningful indigenous character. Worse, if the new religion or new education does not embody a notion of power that is appropriate to indigenous cultures, the goals of the struggle will have been betrayed. Leaders who promote non-indigenous goals will embody non-indigenous values and are simply used, as, uh, used by the state to maintain its control. And we've seen this happen numerous times. I wanted to share with you a couple photos, those who are listening or uh, who are impaired by um, ailments of the eyes won't be able to see this, but this is a, a computer graphic of, um, of what a group at the uh, University of Tennessee figured was a village. Um, today that village, this is actually uh, the Tennessee River, that village is underwater uh, now, but from the uh, the post and things like that, they were able to sort of reconstruct it. Um, it's the, um, the village of Teleco. And uh, this was one of the villages of my uh, third great grandfather. Uh, but it's not here anymore. The other image I wanted to share with you is uh, just, it's a little spring. Well, not so little, it's actually uh, about half the size of this room. But I would go there every chance I got. Um, as a, a Cherokee, a Katua person, I would take my children there to water and do water ceremony. It's called the Blue Spring. It's, the, it's my place. Um, I won't be able to be buried there because you're not allowed. It's a state park. Um, but, but that is my place of, of rest and peace is that spring right there. And, and those are two things that are meaningful to me um, as I think back on who I am and where I come from. So I'm saying that 500 plus years of the Western worldview has not done the earth or the world much good. And you'll have to excuse me, um, sometimes I will use the term America, and I know that uh, really can be uh, uh, taken um, as just the United States of America, but please don't take it that way. But, but if I offend you, just think I mean the United States, okay? <laughs> so... Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, Our nation was born in genocide. We tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today, we, are not permitted, uh, we have not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for this shameful episode. You're a little bit ahead of us in that. Um, for a subject worked and reworked, John Kennedy said, I consider one of our great presidents, um, so often in novels, motion pictures, and television, American Indians remain probably the least understood and most misunderstood Americans of us all. Collectively, their history is our history and should be part of our shared and remembered heritage. When we forget great contributors to our American history, uh, when we neglect the heroic past of the American Indian, we thereby weaken our own heritage. We need to remember the heritage of our forefathers found here and from which they borrowed liberally. So um, these are lessons that we're still trying to learn in the United States. Now I want to tell you a story. This is a Chickamaugan story. Chickamaugan is a particular group um, that my ancestors belonged to. Basically, <coughs> some of you may be happy to know this. Um, our, uh, when the, uh, the Revolutionary, what we call the Revolutionary War broke out, um, our, half our Cherokee people uh, were basically neutral. Uh, the other half fought for the British. And so my ancestors, I always tell people uh, in, in the United States that my uh, third and fourth great grandfathers fought in the Revolutionary War against tyranny from the United States, <laughs> from the colonies. So, um, and, and that group became what's known as the Chickamaugans. And those are my people. Um, we have a story among the Chickamaugans, and it goes like this. It's a, you know what a terrapin is, right? Uh, sometimes we call them box turtles. And we use the box turtle shells for a number of our ceremonies and uh, shakers and, and for our dances and things like that. So 
Um, I guess a long time ago, the box turtle was a whole lot bigger than it is now. And that box turtle would, he was a great warrior, by the way, and, and he would walk down the road, and it, you'll have to excuse me, I'm going to get in front of this some, a little bit and uh, uh, try not to be too distracting. But, but box turtle, terrapin, would walk down the road, and, and, and he would expect everybody to move out of the road for him. And, you know, he was a pretty big guy, and he would walk down the road. And one day, a wolf was coming down the road, and the wolf said to himself, you know, I'm not going to get out of the way of the box turtle this time. I'm not getting out of Terrapin's way at all. He's going to have to move me if he wants me to move. So, sure enough, he walked by and, and Terrapin says, move out of my way. And the wolf says, I'm not moving. So Terrapin just grabbed a hold of him and killed him. I guess that's the first reported incident of road rage. So, so he, he takes Wolf and he cuts his ears off and he puts them on his belts and he starts walking. He's getting hungry by this time, Terrapin is. And, and the first uh, uh, village he comes to, he's thinking, I'm going to make those people feed me and give me a place to sleep for the night. Well, it happened to be Wolf Town. Or maybe it was Wolfville. I'm not sure. <laughs> but so it was, it was Wolf Town. And, and so he goes in and he tells the wolves, he says, I'm hungry. I want some stew. And so they were afraid of Terrapin. They, he had a reputation. So he went and got him some stew. And, uh, and then uh, Terrapin pulls out those wolf ears. And he begins just shoveling them in like spoons, just one after the other. And they recognize those ears. They said, that's our brother's ears. We've got to do something about this. But they were all afraid of Terrapin. So they made a plan, and, and Terrapin goes to sleep. When he woke up the next day, the whole village had gone. It was empty. So Terrapin's walking along, and all of a sudden, they all jumped out from behind the rocks. And they threw some ropes around Terrapin, and they, they said, We got him now. What are we going to do? And so, so one of the wolves said, You know what we should do? We should put him in a big clay pot and boil him up and eat him. And just Terrapin just laughed, and he said, Ha! Huh. He said, if you do that, I'm going to kick that pot to pieces. It's going to put the fire out, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to kill every one of you. So they thought, well, maybe that's not such a good idea. Why don't we tie him to a stake, and then we'll burn him that way? So Terrapin again laughed, and, and he said, yeah. yeah, you do that. I'm going to burn through the ropes. I'm going to take these ropes off. I'm going to jump out of that fire. I'm going to kill every one of you. So... The wolves are thinking, man, what are we going to do? And one of them gets the idea. Hey, why don't we throw them off the cliff into the river? And uh, so Terrapin knew that he was a great swimmer. And, but he wanted to pretend like that's not what he wanted. So he said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. He said, I'll drown if you do that. And so they thought, oh, this is the thing. So they, they take Terrapin and they throw him off the cliff and and he goes down, he's waiting to hit the water, and guess what? The river was low, and he hits rocks. And Terrapin's shell just goes all to pieces everywhere, and he's laying there dying. And Terrapin is just, there's, there's no way, no way on earth that Terrapin is ever going to be healed. And all of a sudden, he remembers this song, this old, old song. And he starts singing this song. It was a, it's a healing song. He says, Whoa, Joey, Joey, Whoa, Joey, Joey. And he's saying, I'm sewing myself back together. I'm sewing myself back together. And something miraculous happened. Some of those shell parts began to come back and form on his back, but there were 13 of them. But they were just small little pieces. And sure enough, it healed Terrapin. And Terrapin got up, and you know what? He walked a whole lot smaller, and he walked a whole lot more humble after that. And that's how I understand the Western worldview. It's terrapin. It's taken, and it's formulated itself, and it's, it's insisted on its way in every single system that we have. Education, religion, economics, trade. 
and it said, we're doing this right, and everybody else has to come and do what we say. Now, I, I also want to just make a, a, an observation. Some of you may have made this observation. I'm, ready. I'm sure probably everybody in the room has made this observation already, but it is a little ironic for a, a people who's part of their understanding of creator and how we communicate that is is pedagogical and and i go as far as to say pedagogy is more important than content when we're teaching it is it is ironic that this is indigenous theology being delivered in a western format just wanted to point it out it's nobody's fault it just is what it is The myth of progressive civilization is based on the Western worldview displaying Greco-Roman, Anglo-Saxon, white supremacy. And for the most part, contemporary historians have proceeded from the presumption that modern people are different from and superior to those who came before, especially those designated as primitives. Distortions and incomplete and even dishonest renderings of the past are found in many modern accounts of ancient peoples and contemporary quote-unquote primitive peoples. These accounts serve to reinforce the sense of difference and to distance moderns from unflattering legacies of the past. And how many of you are familiar with John Mohawk? One of the greatest native writers to ever live. You can use his books in your classes. One of our, our great writers in the United States said this, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. So where do we get these ideas, right, about one civilization being better than the other? Well, one of the myths that came along was how, uh, how Greek civilization came about. Now, if you don't think that we've been influenced by Greco-Roman civilization, uh, at least in the United States, all you have to do is go down to our capital, and you'll notice that Every important building has great Roman pillars in front of it, or Greek. It looks, uh, looks like a, a place out of Greece and Rome. So another thing, uh, a quote by Mohawk, 19th century German scholars seeking Aryan roots for Western civilization promoted the idea that Greek culture arose without antecedents, as if metaphysically from the hills of Greece. Like other cultures, however, Greek civilization was a product of time and place. It was not simply invented out of nothing. Greek culture inherited elements from earlier settlers in the area, as well as from Mesopotamia and other civilizations around the Mediterranean. So I also want you to know that our indigenous cultures did just not uh, arise out of nowhere. It took hundreds and thousands of years to come up with the ethics and the values that through many ceremonies and many dreams and, and many revelations and much wisdom over centuries and centuries and millennium to come up with values and ethics that are reflected of the land in which we live. So we had ideas of democracy. And of course, in my country, we also have ideas of democracy. And I, I want you to show, show you what the... Uh, uh, it looks like uh, democratic freedom in the U.S. looks like. This is called the House Freedom Caucus. Are you ready for this? That's what freedom looks like in the United States. And um, this is uh, Trump's number one man now, Stephen Miller, in case you don't recognize him. He's a dangerous fellow. So um, part of what I'm going to be talking about tonight, I've I've gotten from a number of places over a number of years, but I just wanted to point out, especially to you professors who uh, are sometimes looking for books written by um, uh, non-white uh, folks um, that you can use in your classes, and I want to point out uh, four of those. Um, the first one, The History of White People by Nell Irvin Painter, who's a sociologist at Princeton, and uh, the second, a, a Native man, Robert Williams, who wrote Savage Anxieties, The Invention of Western Civilization. Um, a womanist theologian, Kelly Brown Douglas, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. And then finally, John Mohawk's Utopian Legacies, A History of Conquest and Oppression in the Western World. And those first three books really 
talk about sort of Greece, and the second one, Rome, and then the third one, Anglo-Saxonism. But how would Jesus interpret history? Well, we know he interpreted it different than a lot of the people around him. Uh, we know by passages like Luke 4, 16 to 30, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath, stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll containing the message of Isaiah the prophet was handed him. He unrolled it and took it to the place where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Reading out of Isaiah 61, of course. He has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that Don Trotter will be freed from their oppression, and the year of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant, he sat down, and, and uh, you all sort of know the scripture, what happens, but, but eventually he comes to the point where he, he says this, certainly there, are many, there were many widows in Israel who needed help in Elijah's time, and there was no rain for three and a half years, and hunger stalked the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a widow of Zarephath, a foreigner in the land of Sidon. Or think of the prophet Elisha, who healed Naaman, a Syrian, rather than the many lepers in Israel who needed help. So Jesus, we know he interpreted history different uh, because when he started talking about how God's at work outside of Israel, says they all put them on his shoulders and they said, let's elect Jesus as emperor. Wrong, right? No, the people were furious they jumped up, they mobbed him, they took him to the edge of the hill. They were going to treat him like the wolves did Terrapin, throw him off the hill. And uh, they intended to push him over, but he slipped away through the crowd. So they were so upset because they understood their own history differently than Jesus. So someone said, uh, how many here are anthropologists? Any anthropologists here kind of, kind of dabble in it a little bit? You've probably, if you've taken an anthropology class uh, early on, you'll, you'll hear this phrase. I don't know who invented water, but it probably wasn't a fish. Right? So sometimes we don't understand what we are about, and it takes someone who has developed a different perspective to tell us what we are about. And obviously, they looked at their history different than Jesus. Jesus was reading things like Amos 9, 7. Do you Israelites think you're more important to me than Ethiopians? Ask the Lord, I brought you out of Egypt, but have I not done as much for other nations too? I brought the Philistines from Crete and led the Aramaeans out of Kerr. So I want to give you a little bit of a timeline perspective over the next three nights. We're going to be talking, um, basically tonight is a background to sort of our uh, existence. A lot of it is um, um, pre-colonization. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to, in the next night, we're going to be looking more at uh, the Western worldview, some specific aspects of it, particularly the dualism. And we're also going to be looking at indigenous theologies. But, so tonight, I want to uh, just give you a quick timeline. Um, 28,000 B.C., Santa Rosa Island, California, human hearths, charcoal dated at 28,000 B.C. 4,000 B.C., Kodiak Island, where I spent two years, um, was occupied. It was 3500 B.C. that Sumerians settled in Babylon. It was 3372 B.C. when the Mayan calendar uh, was made, which is more accurate than the Gregorian. How did we travel here? Now, this is where it gets controversial among our peoples because a lot of our people say, well, we were always here, which I'm okay with that too. Um, our stories say that, but let's just say that that you wanted to entertain the other theory. Um, the other theory is that from the last 13,000 to 28,000 years ago, we probably traveled on the kelp beds to get here. Um, 1200 BC, Olmec civilization, which is a pre Aztecan civilization. 753 BC, way down there, the founding of Rome. Um, in 1 AD, the Hokum built sites near Salt River, created a system of irrigation, which I'll tell you about today. Um, in 313, the Edict of Milan, 1300, native populations estimated well over 65 million in the continent later known as North America. Some estimates are up 120 million. So we learn about ancient Greece and China and Egypt. I learned all those things in, in school, uh, but no one ever told me that my own people had a civilization. I wonder why. 
So I, I teach Amer- I've taught American church history 21 times um, in the last 10 years. And uh, I always begin uh, talking about uh, pre-Columbus. So, um, and, and I talk about some of these things. And I, every single class, someone asks in one form or another the same question. Can you think of what they might ask? Why didn't I learn this in school? Why didn't I learn this in school? And I'm talking about, these are master's level, master of divinity, spiritual formation, master of arts and theology students. Why didn't we learn this in school? And it's always the same answer. You weren't supposed to learn this. So great civilizations thrived in the Americas with unparalleled techniques in microagriculture, macroenvironmental management, um, microecology and macroecology, xeriscape, agronomy, botany, forestry, raised beds, naturally self-sustained fertilized gardens, um, sustainable architecture, including passive solar, solar heating, water capture systems, mass water transport systems, humanities, including psychology, philosophy, religion, theology, rhetoric, languages, the arts, ethics, sciences, including math, medicine, surgery, brain surgery, dentistry, leaching poisonous foods to make them edible, healthy waste disposal, urban planning, democratic governments, education systems, intercontinental economic trade, complex peacemaking strategies. All of those were already here. Not everywhere, but they were here before any European ever set foot in the Americas. Ancient American civilizations were much more healthy in many ways in our lifestyle, both personally and environmentally more tolerant of diversity. Our medicines, even today, over 500 medicines and herbal remedies are used in modern medical treatment that were first used by the first peoples of America. Aspirin, quinine, petroleum jelly, Ipecac, digitalis. 60% of the world's food we eat originate in the Americas. All of these four are from our own uh, gardens. Um, We didn't mention, but my wife and I have a small farm And we also have a seed company for uh, open pollinated, uh, mostly indigenous seeds. Corn, potatoes, tomatoes, bell pepper, chili peppers, vanilla, uh, pecans, beans, pumpkins, cassava root, avocado, peanut, turkey, cashew, pineapple, blueberry, sunflower, wild rice, uh, chocolate, gourd, squash, mini melons, sunchokes, all originated in the Americas. All were being utilized. So my people come from what we call mound building cultures. How many are familiar a little bit with mound building cultures? You had mound building cultures in Canada, what is now Canada. Um, I visited some of them towards the big grassy reserve in Ontario. I've been to some of your mounds. Um, These were large cities with large uh, stadiums and palladiums and and gathering places and homes and villages. And and sometimes uh, um, here's a sort of an estimated map of of where the mound building cultures were. Um, At the time of uh, Tutankhamun, the Hittite Empire, Hammurabi, Minoan civilization, Stonehenge and the Shang Dynasty, when they were flourishing, there was Poverty Point, Louisiana, which is one of UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. Um, I know you have one here as well. Um, The commercial and governmental trade center of its day and its time Poverty Point site, uh, which is in modern-day Louisiana, had the largest, most elaborate earthworks anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. No other known earthen constructions approached the size of Poverty Point until the 19th century. Poverty Point is recognized by the United Nations as a World Heritage Site. There are also places like, um, if you've been to St. Louis area, all of East St. Louis was basically a s- series of large cities, but they saved one, they call it Cahokia, they had about 40,000, and uh, Cahokia was this great place. Um, but um, the myth now that they have a Cahokia as a tourist attraction is that there was the Cahokia, um, but I say there were hundreds of Cahokias, maybe thousands of Cahokias. Our southwestern Native American culture, um, we have uh, just returned from the southwest not too long ago and are still impressed. But uh, Chaco Canyon is one of those. This is a uh, 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 rendition 
of what it may have looked like at one time. Um, between 8900 and 1150, Chaco Canyon was a major center of culture for ancient Pueblo peoples. By AD 1115, at least 75 outlying cities had been built within the 30,000 square miles composing agricultural communities, trading posts, and ceremonial sites in the San Juan Basin. They were connected to the Central Canyon to one another by six major Chacoan roads. These main roads extended to at least another 60 roads, well-researched and surveyed in generally straight routes, lit up at night as with signal fires, Chaco also served as an astrological observatory, which most of our sites did, by the way. Um, the Hokum culture, or Pima Papago peoples, uh, living in the Sonoran Desert since circa 2000 BCE, uh, they engineered in the 7th to the 14th centuries a complex series of canals, weirs, irrigation networks, with features of remarkable genius rivaling the sophistication of those used in the ancient Near East, Egypt, and China. Casa Grande, Grande a notable structure also served as an astrological observatory. 500 miles of canals irrigated 110,000 acres in the driest land now, you can imagine, Sonoran Desert. The food produced by this advanced irrigation system is believed to have supported up to 80,000 people, the highest population density in the prehistoric Southwest. Today, Phoenix metro area is reutilizing many of these ancient canals for similar purposes. Where I live in the Pacific Northwest, um, there were uh, a number of elaborate uh, things, art, um, keeping track of clan systems and relations or uh, mathematical um, hoops that one has to jump to to figure that out. Those were all figured out. And uh, it was the breadbasket of um, probably uh, what we would call North America. Um, within 100 miles, uh, probably the di most densely populated area of, uh, from Mexico up through British Columbia. Um, a third of the indigenous population of the Americas uh, were located there. And if correct, that could mean between 20 and 60 million people. 6,000 year old record shows that up until the past two centuries, the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest never suffered from drought conditions. Theirs were societies of abundance, not need. So what happened? I know we've all talked about the doctrine of discovery now for some time. We know what that is. The, the Pope's uh, decree, at least one of them, that uh, papal bull, um, the one in 1493, intercatira, any Christian king, prince, or nation could discover, quote unquote, and assume dominion over lands previously known to non-Christians, but unknown to Christians. But these lands were already inhabited. So here's some of the population estimates. Most of these come out of um, uh, Charles C. Mann's book, 1491. How many are familiar with that? And then have you read 1493? There's two great books that uh, everybody should be reading. Um, and uh, these are the pump, some of the population estimates that he gives. So what happened? The first destructive wave was weather. You can't win against weather. In about a 150 year period, approximately from 1125 to 1275 AD, America experienced several super droughts. Some estimate that as a result, there were up to 50% population loss. This period coincides with the abandonment of places like Chaco Canyon, Cahokia Mounds, Okmogi Mounds, Effigy Mounds, Gila Cliff Dwellings, Chichen Itza in Mexico, and others. When these cycles of drought began, many people of these civilizations were at their, the civilizations were at their height, communities were densely populated. Even with good rains, the people were likely using their land to its limits though. Without rain, it was impossible to grow enough food to support the population. Widespread famine occurred. By the 1300s, most of the large Native American cities had all but died out and new patterns began. And that may be a lesson we have to learn again. Second wave, disease. The unintended but relished outcome of colonization. As much as 95% of the indigenous people died almost immediately on contact with European, uh, various European diseases, particularly smallpox. That would have amounted to about one fifth of the world's population at the time. A level of destruction unequaled before or since. The stunning death rates of Native Americans who succumbed to European pathogens was due part 
uh, to lack of exposure, but also due to genetic traits that limited native people's ability to deal with these unseen killers. Indigenous peoples are free of many genetic diseases, but have a relatively narrow genetic range. American Indians have only about 17 human lycotes, antigens, HLAs, uh, classes as opposed to Europeans having on the average of 35. HLAs are one of the human body's two main lines of defenses against sickness. Helper T cells are, in the case of Native Americans, oriented predominantly against parasites, but not as focused on bacteria and viruses as the immune systems of Europeans. Unfortunately, as a result of their clean living standards and lack of exposure to pathogens of medieval Europe, the native people of this land did not develop the resistance to common European diseases such as mumps, measles, and chickenpox, not to mention the deadlier vectors of infections like the Black Death or smallpox. Today, we recognize the wisdom of native habits and personal cleanliness. The importance of good hygiene is the foundation of today's modern medicines. As a result, entire groups would be decimated by simple childhood illnesses. The European plagues that decimated native populations came in wave after wave, with some plagues individually and others collectively having mortality rates of 95%. And when you see those 95 to 100% mortality rates, that means that probably several diseases came at the same time. These diseases were for the most part introduced incidentally, through, although at times with purposeful deliberation, um, I saw a city named Ambrose, I think. Uh, uh, no, Am Amherst. Yeah, Amherst. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's named after General Jeffrey Amherst, British officer who was the first to use smallpox blankets on Native Americans. Yeah. We have a, a, an Amherst College in the U.S. and another town with that name. The diseases were, for the most part, uh, uh, introduced incidentally, though at times with purposeful deliberation, but nearly always noted with celebration or observed with dispassion and distance. These plagues wreaked havoc on traditional Indian societies. The savages, most of the colonists saw, without ever realizing it, were usually the traumatized, destitute survivors of ancient, advanced civilizations that had collapsed almost overnight. In the end, the loss to the whole world was incalculable. The third wave of uh, was, uh, destruction was attempted genocide. Now you've probably heard the quote by Christopher Columbus, all these lands are densely populated with the best people under the sun. They have neither ill will nor treachery. And then he talked about their generosity. And then he talked about how few uh, people it would take to actually take over and control them. Different worldview. Um, Carl Starkloff, the people of the center, Anthropologists said, um, on reading various accounts and monographs by explorers and anthropologists, what strikes one is the almost universal hospitality shown by Indian tribes, especially to their white visitors. It's quite remarkable, as described in David Bushnell's writings about explorers and missionaries among the Suian, Alg Suan, Algonquin, and Caddoan tribes west of the Mississippi, there are practically no examples of inhospitality or harsh treatment rendered to whites. On the contrary, the tribal leaders went out of their way to receive these visitors as special guests. There seems to have been a conviction among the Indians, at least until the mid-19th century, that they and the newcomers could share the land equally, even if the land was sometimes thought to be the tribe's sacred inheritance. So one of our early um, um, pilgrims, uh, separatist was a man named William Bradford and when he discovered a whole village had been, of Wampanoag had been wiped out, um, he, his statement, he's a theologian of course, uh, the good hand of God favored our beginnings by sweeping away the great multitudes of the natives that he may, may, might make room for us, which was a pretty typical uh, attitude. Um, Christian mission was used as a colonizing strategy the 1637 mass curve of a friendly Pequot village, as described by Cotton Mather, those that escaped the fire were slain with the sword, some hewn to pieces, others run through with the rapiers. Uh, it was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire and the streams of blood quenching out the same. And horrible was the stink and stench thereof 
But the victory seemed sweet, a sweet sacrifice, and they gave the prayers thereof to God, who had wrought so wonderfully for them, thus to enclose their enemies in their hands. How North America came to be, violent land theft, armed removal and relocation, forced breakup of families, outlawing indigenous religion, bureaucratic policies of extermination, assimilation and racism, rape of the land. In other words, terrorism. One of our, the, uh, our uh, sec former Secretary of State, known as one of the, the um, uh, as a uh, politically compromising giant, Henry Clay, said this in 1825, there was never a full-blooded Indian that ever took to civilization. It's not in their nature. They are a race destined for extinction, and I do not think they are worth preserving. They are inferior to the Anglo-Saxon race, which is now quickly replacing them on this continent. They are not an improvable breed, and their disappearance from the human family will be no great loss to the world. In point of fact, they are rapidly disappearing, and if government should take proper action in 50 years from this time, there will not be any of them left. Sorry that didn't work out for you, Henry. <laughs> for more than five centuries, the doctrine of discovery and the international laws based upon it and popular movements such as Manifest Destiny have legalized and rationalized the theft of land labor and resources from indigenous peoples across the world and systemically denied their human rights. This is true in America. The doctrine of discovery originated with the Christian church and was based on Christian scriptures, including the Great Commission, the divine mandate to rule based in Romans 13, and the narrative of a covenantal people justified in taking land, uh, possession of the land as described in the Exodus story. The doctrine of discovery is still maintained in US law today. Ethnic cleansing and genocidal repercussions that happen to elders, babies, families, tribes, societies, civilizations, property, post-colonial stress disorder. Um, a lot of uh, native psychiatrists and psychologists will say that if you're a Native American, you have post-colonial stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder and intergenerational trauma. The results of the colonial plague of intergenerational trauma uh, we just did a, a book, um, uh, I think Bill Brackney, who's my former American history, church history professor, by the way, and I think he may do some things with you all here, is that right, or once in a while? Um, he edited this uh, uh, book, Poverty and Poor in the World's uh, Religious Traditions. I wrote the chapter um, on indigenous people's ideas of poverty and poor. Um, but there's a strategic plan by both church and state in, in uh, Canada, it was uh, predominantly the church with the state's help. In the U.S., it was predominantly the state with the church's help um, to create a planned dependency, um, uh, dependency in spiritual matters, physical matters, and economic matters. In many white folks' minds, indigenous must continue to be held as either the poor Indian in need of rescue or admired from a distance as a vanishing race of noble savages and yet we can be self-empowering self-sustaining self-theologizing and teachers to white society if we carry intergenerational trauma then we also carry intergenerational wisdom it's in our genes and our DNA So we keep running into the same problems. It's based on this myth of superiority. We keep running into things in our country and in your country um, uh, that show us that things have not actually changed as much. They just seem to happen less often. Uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, after generations long, you know about that. Uh, four nations didn't sign. You know, same four culprits um, who are not happy to accommodate indigenous people a lot of times. The United States, probably the worst. Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. 
Um, you know, eventually they, they were signed. Um, we've experienced these things ourselves. We had a, created a, a center for empowerment for Native people on 50 acres in Kentucky. Uh, we had a community, uh, we had training, we had schools, we had elders living and helping us. And uh, it was empowering Native people. But there is just something about um, the, uh, a, a segment of the white population that can't stand to see Native people empowering themselves. And so a group of white supremacists came against us with a 50 caliber machine gun. Um, and they fired that day and night on our property line and no one would help us. There were, so people were like, well, those people in Kentucky are really rednecks. Yeah, but you know, the county sheriff wouldn't help us. The state's attorney general wouldn't help us. The justice department wouldn't help us and fair housing wouldn't help us because we were just a bunch of Indians to them. And so we were trying to empower ourselves. Um, but apparently being indigenous is still a threat um, to white normalcy. My good friend Adrian Jacobs said this this way. What are the first steps? As in any recovery from a debilitating social cultural problem, the journey begins with, hello, my name is blank. I have a problem. I'm proposing that Aboriginal culture, worldview, frame of reference, and in this case, Aboriginal Christianity offers hope to Western peoples. Aboriginal people are not your problem. We are your cure. We are the conscience of your technology, Adrian says. We are the humanizers of your institutions. We matter quite apart from your recognition of our worth. We are a threat to entrenched powers that be who refuse to open the doors of opportunity and choice to all. We are a challenge to the mindset of greed, the avarice of Babylon, calling for equitable distribution of resources and the spirit of the Jewish year of Jubilee. We are good medicine for you. There's another story about a turtle. I don't know how much time I have here. Um, I think I'm okay. Okay. <coughs> that we have. It's a, it's a Cherokee story, but I, I know other people uh, have a story similar. And the story goes like this. Um, back in the day, like old days, um, the animals were a whole lot bigger. Obviously, right? You remember the story about the terrapin. Well, the animals were a whole lot bigger than they are today, and they only lived on this one small place. And in, in Cherokee country, we call that Blue Mountain. I think it's named after some white dude now, but um, it used to be called Blue Mountain at one time. And, uh, and, and the animals came together, and they were running out of room, and they said, you know, if we keep populating, we're not going to have any more room. And so they said, let's go to Creator, and let's ask Creator to make more land for us. He, you know, Creator can do that. And so... So they did, and so Creator thought, hmm, if I just make land for them, they won't be grateful for it. So, so here's what I want you to do. So he says to the animals, if you will send somebody down to the bottom of the water and grab some mud from the bottom of the water and come back up, I'll take that mud and I'll spread it all over. So the animals said, okay, sounds good. Who wants to do it right away? Grandmother Turtle stood up and she said, I'll go get the mud. And everybody didn't want to be rude, but they, they, they also didn't want to wait for Grandma Turtle. She was kind of slow and she was old. And so they said, um, how about Duck? Duck, would you go get the, the mud? And so Duck says, sure. So Duck swims out a ways and, and she dives down and a couple seconds later, she pops back up. And then she dives down again, and she pops back up. And then she does it a third time, and she pops back up and comes back kind of embarrassed and says, you know, I'm a, I'm a better floater than I am diver. And so they're like, okay, okay, well, who else can we send? And so right away, Grandmother Turtle says, I'll go get the mud. And so this time, they just actually said, Grandmother Turtle, you know, let's find somebody more qualified. So, so they looked around and they thought, who's a good diver? And they saw Otter. 
And Otter's an excellent diver and swimmer. And so they said, hey, Otter, would you go get the mud? And Otter says, sure, I'll go get it. And so Otter jumps in, takes off. Otter's gone for one day, two days. The third day he comes back. And they look, and he's down the beach, and he's laying on his back, and he's eating a clam. And they, rock, they all run down the beach, and they say, Otter, you know, why are you doing this? Where's the mud? And he said, the, oh, yeah. Well, you know, I got going, and I saw a fish, and I started chasing it, and then I saw these clams. And, and what was I after anyway? Oh, Otter, you're no good. So, so now they, they wanted to find somebody serious who would go get the mud. And so right away, Grandma the Turtle steps back up, and she goes, I will go get the mud. And this time they just said, crowded her out and said, Grandmother Turtle, you know, could you just be quiet back there? Let's find somebody who's really qualified. And so Beaver steps forward and Beaver says, you know what? I'm a good swimmer. I'm a good diver. I don't eat fish. You don't have to worry about that. And I work all the time. I don't play. So you don't have to worry about that. So, so grandmother, or so Beaver's gone all this time. And she's gone for one day, two days, three days, and the fourth day she comes back and she says, it's impossible. There's no way that anybody can get to the bottom and get the mud that's required. So they were all sad, and in the middle of their crying around and their sadness, Grandmother Turtle doesn't say a word, but she just slowly walks through the crowd, and she slides down into the water, and she's gone. And so they're they're afraid for Grandmother Turtle, of course. But who else were they going to send? So Grandmother Turtle's gone. She's gone for three days, then four days, and they're starting to get worried after the fourth day. So they put Squirrel up in the tree, you know, and to keep a watch. And fifth day goes, the sixth day goes, and on the seventh day, Squirrel yells out, I see something, I see something coming up. And they look, and they can see the reflection, and Grandmother Turtle is floating up to the top. Her legs are all out, her head's out, her tail's out, and she's dead. It killed her. So Duck and Beaver and Otter all swim out, and they bring Grandmother Turtle back, and everybody's sitting around, and they're crying, and they're sad because, you know, Grandmother Turtle gave her life, and they're sad because they had no way to have more land. They didn't know what they're going to do. And as they were crying and talking and comforting one another, somebody said, hey, what's that in Grandmother Turtle's claw? And they reached down and they pulled her claws out. And in her hand was this little ball of mud. And that ball of mud, they took it to Creator. And they said, Creator, here's, here's what happened. And Creator took that ball of mud and Creator spread it around and made today what we call Turtle Island. Because if you look, North America is in the shape of a turtle. And Creator honored Grandmother Turtle's sacrifice by calling it Turtle Island. And we have a, a little tagline that goes with that where the animals were getting impatient. And, and so they said, hey, Grandpa Buzzard, why don't you go dry off the land? And so Grandpa Buzzard started you know, flapping his wings, and everywhere his wings went down, created a valley, and everywhere his wings went up, created a mountain, and, you know, he was, he was going across the, the mountains, and, and then he got out to, you know, the plains, and somebody stopped him and said, hey, you know, Grandpa Buzzard, if you don't stop, there won't be any more flat land, so he just coasted for a while, and then he started back. And... But, you know, when I, when I tell that story, uh, to little native kids, you know what the first thing they say is? I don't even have to finish the story. Can you guess? They say they should have listened to Grandma Turtle. She was the elder. Our indigenous people have been here a long time. I see myself here as a predecessor to every um, um, indigenous person, person in the Wabanaki Confederacy, Mi'kmaq, others, that you will invite to, you, to your place and your organization to share wisdom with you and to be on every committee. 
I'm, uh, I'm here hopefully uh, maybe opening the door or continuing to open the door as it will um, for those people to help you on your land and to help you with your worldview. And the next two nights we'll be talking about worldview. So before we get to some uh, discussion and questions, uh, everybody will always go, well, what can we do? Um, and so that's always uh, a question of uh, European minds. European minds want to know. They want, they want a quick, they, they can fix everything, right? So they want to know what we can do to fix it right away. And uh, that's just sort of part, part of the worldview. Um, and so, um, so, so usually the, the answer to that is, well, just listen for a long time. But after you're done listening for a long time, um, Here's a little paradigm that I just throw up um, to give you ideas. Um, what must white Western folks do, both structurally and individually, to heal the relationships between themselves and creator and the land and indigenous peoples? It starts, I think, with awareness. Um, it's exactly what you're doing tonight, an education process led by indigenous people in their comfort zone. So, um, so what you may want to do is um, not... Uh, necessarily ask the indigenous people of this land to always come here but go to where they are um, and pay them well because most times we don't get paid well um, now uh, I'm happy with what I'm receiving here so don't take that as any kind of inference okay so um, but but often that's not the case secondly we need to lament um, together because that is part of becoming a community. Confession in the public square, speaking truth to power, allowing time for it to sink in. And then reparations, or what I call rehumanizing. Restitution first, because that's almost always the last or the never thing that, that gets done. Um, and that's exactly, I think, the thing that helps uh, Western folk to be able to actually take it seriously. And at one time, Dan Rather, who was one of our uh, uh, correspondents, was interviewing Mother Teresa. And uh, Dan decided to ask her a theological question. He said, Mother Teresa, why did Jesus say the, the poor will always be here with us? And she looked at him kind of funny, and she said, well, that's easy. If the poor are never with us, the rich can't be saved. And then finally, memorializing. Working together in partnership, retelling history, codifying the markers. It's interesting that so often in the Old Testament you see, you know, when a great thing happens in, in uh, ancient Jewish history, you know, there are marker stones put down to memorialize those things so that generations will know what happened here. To restore relationship means looking back to go forward. What was the uh, original relationship supposed to be with the creator, the land, the indigenous people of this area? It requires a new paradigm based on re-empowering the host authority of indigenous people of the land. It may not mean tribal governments always, uh, it may mean other agencies, um, so you have to be open. Um, constant process of decolonizing the Western worldview of settler colonialism and re-indigenizing the local, regional, watershed, indigenous perspective and values. Um, and so I asked the question, how does this speak to the faith question? How does it speak to churches? How does it speak to politics? How does it speak to education? How does it speak to our economic systems? What is brought from the European tribes that should stay and what should be discarded? At this time, uh, I think Danny, uh, would you like to come up and we'll, we'll do some Q&A and you know, those kinds of things? This is coming uh, from someone on the live stream. Thank you for your presentation. Given what you shared about history of the doctrine of dis discovery, ethnic cleansing, etc., I heard that Christianity is a white man's religion and thus some indigenous people uh, have rejected Christianity. What are your thoughts on this, Dr. Woodley? Yeah. Well, some is an understatement. <laughs> 
first of all. Um, yeah, so it, it's an interesting dilemma, um, especially those of us who uh, have a relationship with Jesus um, and uh, um, have grown further into our indigeneity in that relationship. Uh, there's always those who walk away from that point, um, and maybe that's something they need to go through. Um, but if you're, if you're following Christianity and saying, is Christianity compatible with uh, in, uh, indigenous values, I would say, well, it depends what history you read what day. Um, I'm not sure that Christianity is uh, compatible with indigenous values, but following Jesus seems to be. And so if you're more interested in following Jesus than following Christianity, I, uh, I don't think there's any conflict. So, yeah. Just to follow up on that, um, having said what you just said, how would you delineate Christianity from following Jesus? Well, Christianity is, we, we can't, I, I think what we do, and part of this is the, the worldview, uh, is to be able to pick and choose the parts that, that we like, right? Um, uh, you know, we all have sort of like bad actors in our families, right? That, you know, we maybe don't put them up front right away. Um, but, uh, uh, but if we take the, it as a whole and, and we study and we understand um, you know, my understanding is that we, we basically married empire um, uh, with Constantine, and we've never been able to separate ourselves since. So um, it doesn't mean that um, Christians, so I say it this way, um, you can be a Christian and follow Jesus, but it's really difficult. <laughs> So I have a question I want to ask. Uh, you mentioned the Great Commission in one of your slides and how that's connected with colonization. Uh, would you be able to tease that out a little bit more? And then following that, can you tell us how followers of Jesus should read the Great Commission? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, what I mentioned, it was in reference in the Doctrine of Discovery is one of the, the uh, scriptures that have been used um, to sort of trample over folks, right? So I, at one point in my life, I was uh, what I would call a flaming evangelist. So um, uh, if you've ever heard of the Billy Graham Knox School of Evangelism or the Two Question Test with Glad Scott Tiding School or the uh, Four Spiritual Laws or, um, you know, um, the, uh, the Evangelism Explosion. So I trained in all those at one time when I was a younger person. And I was at malls, and I was at Jesus festivals, and I was on the streets, and I was, at, and and man, I was leading people to Jesus, right? But I always had this like sinking feeling inside. It was like, what what is going on? There's there's something wrong with this, and I don't get what I'm doing. What they told me to do, they told me that following Jesus means to just get other people to follow Jesus. Well, there was a whole lot of in between that I was missing, and one of the things I was missing was that. Um, I was treating people as objects of, of my agenda. And I had no concern for as much for their person as I did for their soul. And I was operating in a dualistic way. And, um, and, and so I began to wrestle with that. And one of the things I did was I said, well, I, I need help understanding. And so I went to different places and people and I sought help to give me a, a more balanced view. And it's in that time when someone told me one time, he said, why don't, you, why don't you just interpret Scripture in your indigenous eyes? And I was like offended at that. I was like, well, what do you mean, you know? And I thought about that for years, and it had, took years because I'm kind of slow on the uptake. So, uh, but I eventually realized that, oh, you know, Jesus was not an uh, Enlightenment-bound thinker. Jesus was like this tribal dude, you know, more like indigenous thinking. And uh, in fact, none of the scriptures are, are really written from an enlightenment view. It's just that they've been taught that way. And so I began to understand the scriptures differently. And I began to understand Jesus differently. And I began to understand that, that this is a sacred time 
when a person comes to follow Jesus and to treat them as if I uh, disregard any point in their life and any part of their life um, is, is really not being uh, treating a person as a sacred human being. And so, um, so I had to rethink that. And, and my understanding now um, is that um, uh, it, it's not that that scripture is no good or doesn't count. It's just how I go about doing that is very different than, than it was at one point in my life. Any questions from the floor? You can come up to the microphone, please. Can I just shout real loud? You hit you hinted on this a little bit. So how then should we read the Exodus movie in the Canaan story? So the question Yeah. So how do we read the Exodus story? Yeah. Yeah, in comparison. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can do a couple things here. Uh, that's the question that most uh, professors don't want you to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and I can also say that I'm not an Old Testament scholar. <laughs> but you want to know how I read it, right? So how I understand the Exodus story is that it was written a good number of years after it happened, and it was written for a particular reason to drum up nationalism among Israel. And to this date, there's still no proof that it actually ever happened. So how I read it is that um, what I understand is that the scriptures are telling me this is what can happen when you go for extreme nationalism. So what's written is true, and it's the truth that I understand. Any other questions from in the room here? Okay, next question from and online. I, let me go back to oh, that okay. just one more time. <laughs> I'll talk more about this um, tomorrow real quick. Um, but one of the differences in understanding um, uh, story, right? And, um, you know, my OT profs at... Uh, I, I, I broke out, and you'll see it tomorrow, this little pie chart that says that 75% of the, of the uh, scriptures are, are uh, narrative. And uh, my two OT profs there said, no, no, about more like 90% narrative, right? So it really comes down to how do you understand narrative? And the Western worldview says you understand narrative as fact. And the indigenous worldview says you understand narrative as truth. I'll follow that up uh, with a different question that came in. Uh, during your lecture tonight, you uh, told us two stories. And typically in our churches, when we hear stories, it's to illustrate a point that was already given. It's a lot more brief, tends to have a funny punchline uh, in the sermon. Uh, but stories are utilized in a different way uh, in, with uh, indigenous pedagogy. Could you just comment on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so in, in my... Uh, among my tribal people, and a lot of the groups in the southeast, um, we are part of uh, um, uh, what we call stomp dance culture. That's our religion. Our, the idea comes from uh, the sun is the most visible thing um, that we can really see, and uh, we, we um, think of the creator being behind that, um, as uh, in that our, one of our words, in Nethlenahi, means the one behind everything, and the sun's is sort of a representation of that. So you'll see a lot of pottery and things, and, and on my tattoos, if I was going to take my shirt off right now, which is not something you want to see. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you see that sun symbol, the ancient sun symbol. And, uh, and then our fire, uh, which sort of represents God, and uh, our fire, uh, which is a sacred fire, um, is the incarnation or God coming to earth, his pres God's presence on earth. And we dance around that fire all night. And uh, we sing different songs and we dance and, and things like that. And during the stomp dance, we have what's called a preacher. Um, not, you know, an ordained Christian preacher, but our spiritual leaders. And they're just called the preacher, I guess, because that name stuck after a while. And, and they stand around the fire and they talk in each person's setting with their different clans and they they teach and preach if you will um, and they tell stories like that okay 
because those stories tell us how to live. They talk about our ethics. They talk about our worldview. They talk about um, the values that we're supposed to have and how we're supposed to treat other people and treat the earth and things like that. And that's the main event, right? But in the Western world, it's the sort of the stories, the sort of way, either the, the thing you tell before or the concluding point or the children's thing or, you know. And, uh, you know, people love to hear stories, right? You have some great writers up here in Canada. Um, and, and, and those stories, because what we do is we relate to our humanness in those stories. We relate and we find ourselves often in those stories. And so to me, if I was doing this thing, if you said, hey, let's do this in your comfort zone, then we would be around a fire and we would all be around and I'd be walking around talking to you uh, by that fire. And, and I would tell mostly stories. Question came in and asked, could you ex uh, explain to us a uh, creator from an indigenous perspective when you use the word creator? Uh, like if I could do that, I could probably, you know, like, I don't know what, uh, be king of the world or something. <laughs> How many people have tried to do that? Um, a creator is creator. It's creator is um, the being from which everything exists and comes. And, uh, and as it says in Colossians 1, the creator holds everything together. And so um, I understand uh, my role as a human being and in human beings' role to be that which keeps harmony of all of these things. And so um, the creator uh, uh, to me is, and do they want me to explain it theologically, like, Trinity and all that kind of stuff, or how? What are we? Where are we at right now? I, I read it exactly how they put it. So okay, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. Maybe he'll clarify, and I'll yammer around a bit till he does. But um, so uh, uh, you know, Creator, and and to me, and uh, I understand uh, my understanding. This is my own personal view, uh, and my own theological development is that, uh, and it actually states pretty clear in the scripture that Jesus is creator. So John 1, pretty emphatic. He made everything that was made and nothing was made without him. Colossians 1, 17 and following. You know, not only did he create everything that exists in the world, but he holds everything together. Hebrews 1, 1. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. You know, the writers of the New Testament didn't know what to do with Jesus. It's like, how do you experience creator becoming human flesh? Well, so they said he was with God and he is creator. And so um, for me, when I pray to creator and when I understand my people praying to creator, I understand they're praying to Jesus. Now, maybe they don't want to, to, to look at it that way. That's okay. In my mind, they're still praying to Jesus because the Bible says that he, has, he is the creator. And theologically, we say he has the efficacy of creation, right? But not, that's not a, uh, this uh, cosmic Christ is not an idea that the West has really relished talking about for some reason. And, and, and not to get into modalism, that's not what I'm trying to do, like, you know, well, the Father does this, the Spirit does this, Jesus does this. It's not that. It's not that Jesus does this. But, but Jesus exists in the perfect community, the, what I call the community of the Creator, and perfect shalom, and preference and deference, this unity and diversity that has its mark on all creation, everything created. There's nothing singular in the whole multiverse no matter how far down you biology folks in here. So you keep going, and you keep going, you keep going, you get down to a cell, and you keep going, and you get down to the atom, and you keep going, and, and you break the atom apart, and it has parts. And then finally, you know, a group of people, uh, you know, got the Nobel Prize, uh, what was that, six, seven years ago? Because they discovered quarks. They knew they were there, but quarks are these little lights inside the atoms. And the quarks, the strange thing about them, they change colors, and they move around but they're never single because creator 
DNA, creator's fingerprint, is unity and diversity. And um, sometimes humans are the last ones to figure that out. But uh, yeah. I'm going to ask a question uh, from myself. <clears throat> um, what do you do when you hear a, a rebuttal from the type of stuff you presented by pulling out a single one instance or two instances where indigenous nations or cultures did something bad to themselves or bad to the environment. Uh, I, I, I encountered that when I actually, I ended up taking your spot. If you remember last year, you weren't able to get to IBR mm -hmm. for a response. And so mm -hmm. I, they asked me to do the indigenous response. And, and one of the responses to my response was a quick, uh, pushing aside of my perspective because, uh, well, indigenous people don't have it, didn't have it right either. And then they trotted up like one, one example and therefore it was all just dismissed. Um, and, and that kind of, so my question goes with another person uh, who was asking, uh, how do we uh, hold up, like you said, where there's some things from the European um, society or worldview that should be held and some that should be discarded. Mm -hmm. How do we, can we be both grateful and appalled at the same time mm -hmm. at things that came uh, through European expansion? Well, no, native culture is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that question was asked because <clears throat> sometimes in binary thinking, that's what we get, right? We, we go, well, we're either good or bad. And the truth is, is that um, none of us are all good or all bad, and none of our societies are all good or all bad. We're working through stuff, um, and, and we still don't get it right every time, right? Um, our indigenous cultures, and there's lots of times when we didn't get it right before, but, but we've been learning on this continent longer than anybody else. So I think we got more right more often um, and, and have wisdom to share about that. Or you can just say, no, that's a dumb question. <laughs> no, there's no such thing. So. Any other questions from the room? Yeah. Come up to the mic, is that okay? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Woodley. I've been trying to figure out how to formulate this question. Okay. Um, in, in your presentation, you used scripture and talked about scripture, but you also talked about how um, the second wave of kind of death and um, disaster that struck when the Western um, settlers and colonials came was um, like diseases. Um, and oftentimes it wasn't necessarily intended, but that was part of the, the interaction. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, when you think about scripture um, and the way that it arrived in North America on the, the back of disease and kind of wave after wave of death, um, does that affect how you see the value of scripture versus the value of kind of revelation, general revelation to um, indigenous peoples and the wisdom that you've collected over the years? Um, is there any kind of conflict there? Because I guess I struggle a little bit with the feeling that when our cultures met, it was necessity that there would be that level of death just based off of hygiene and, and cultural practices. Yeah, so flesh that out just a little bit more. For me. Yeah, sure, so I guess I'm thinking in European culture, um, you talked about kind of a lack of the hygiene practices that were in the New World and how that led to resistances, um, which led to um, germs that weren't a huge deal to um, most of the population in Europe. When they arrived here, they caused great devastation and death um, amongst population okay. that wasn't kind of... Okay, let me correct just sure. a little thing. So I wasn't saying that um, indigenous people had a hygiene problem. No. I was saying European people had sure, a hygiene Sure, I was trying to say that, so, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but because of that um, kind of inequality in terms of hygiene practices, um, when the Western settlers arrived, um, there was a lot of death. Um, but also, um, I guess in my, in my Western mind, um, with a huge emphasis on scripture and the importance of scripture in understanding Jesus and his context and his teaching, um, that, that arrived in that same kind of manner. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, and so I wonder, um, with scripture arriving with so much death and destruction, um, is that, that seems difficult for me 
to kind of feel comfortable with or to mm -hmm. feel like it has been imposed or how could, I don't know, is that? Yeah, okay, I think I understand Sorry, what you're I'm saying. Sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit. Like, kind of to, to boil it down to the, the lowest, yeah. uh, like how, how could we believe the scriptures after all this has happened, is that? Yeah, and, and, and the baggage that comes with, even if that is something, you know, good, despite kind of yeah. the baggage that comes with it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay, a couple things. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, I'm, I, I, different, uh, just to let you know, I'm, th this is uh, different than most of my indigenous friends, just so you don't blame any of the people I hang with for this, right? So I don't believe the scriptures should have ever been written for our people. Um, we already had our own way of, of knowing stories, our own epistemologies, and they were probably more accurate. Um, and so uh, the stories should have been told, um, and we would have learned the stories. Now, I'm sorry if anybody's from Wycliffe or anywhere like that. Uh, but uh, um, but I, I, I believe the Word of God is not the Bible, but the stories held within. And Jesus, of course, is the Word of God. So, um, uh, secondly, I would say that the, um, uh, like, like I've, I've only met three uh, native atheist in my whole life, right? So, um, and, and, and all three people had to work pretty hard at it to, to get there. <laughs> Two of them learned it in universities. Uh, but, uh, um, but I've also n never spent time with any traditional person, and I've spent time with a lot of different traditional people from a lot of different traditions over the years, who didn't just, was absolutely thought Jesus was just great. Right? But kind of like Gandhi, it's like, you know, it's the Christians that I have trouble with, right? But, um, but in our people, generally, okay, now in, this is complicated response because um, we have, uh, what I see is two layers of traditional people now. And forgive me uh, if I offend anybody, but um, so I was, uh, my wife and I were both really fortunate to be able to be around like old elders, right? Old elders who understood themselves well, um, uh, and who were generous to a fault, who had so much grace, much more than I do. Um, and I, so when I try to, uh, to come about these things, I try to think, well, and I think of the various people, family and others, what would they say or what would they want me to say um, but but then we have a sort of a new class of uh, folks um, and I call those neo-traditional um, and they don't have a lot of grace and they don't have a lot of tolerance and they they um, uh, tend to get angry really quick and there's nothing wrong with anger by the way but um, and so um, but in this other group of people that I'm talking about I never met anyone who didn't have grace for anyone who wanted to follow Jesus because each person's spirituality has to be worked out themselves. Um, and, and they have so much grace that they don't have to look at all the bad things, that they, they are so forgiving they can forgive all the bad. And uh, it doesn't mean that you ignore the bad. It just means that you can forgive it and realize that, hey, we're all human beings. Um, we all make mistakes. Um, we're just, uh, I travel all across the United States and Canada, um, for, for so many years. And, you know, there's one, uh, one sort of, uh, message that would come across in sweat lodges and other places that, that I would say, well, what does that mean? And you know how many places we went to where they said it meant the same thing, a prayer, um, uh, and a song in, in that would say something like, Creator, when you look down on me, have pity because I'm just a human being. And that seems to be one of our great theological statements. Um, we're just human beings. And so we also can forgive other human beings. Um, because um, uh, we would, if we were perfect, we would be God. We would be creator. We would, so, so we're all, and, and being human and being vulnerable, to me, is the most human thing you can be. 
I consider the creator to be the most vulnerable being that exists. And it's in my vulnerability um, that I exhibit my spirituality, my humanness. So being human is a good thing. So I, I guess the simple answer is, well, we're just all human, and so we have to continue to work together. He's been going for about an hour and 45 minutes, so we'll stop there. If you have any further questions, you can send them or tweet them in, and we have the Red Couch conversation where uh, some more will be asked. So let's uh, thank him and enjoy thank some. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.